Hey, George, how are you? Doing fine. Doing fine. Thank you. Good. You're looking very well. You're looking very well indeed. Oh, yeah. One guy told me I was not looking at well and it started a big fight. <laughs> Even now, no one, no, no one in their right mind would pick on you, surely. <laughs> um, you don't look as scary as you used to, George, but that's not the intention anymore, is it? <laughs> no, there was a time you wanted to have a, a slight bit of an intimidating look, but that was necessary. But now my granddaughters and my grandkids, they tear up on me. <laughs> I'm trying to make sure they don't intimidate me. And that was one of the things I actually wanted to ask you about. So a lot of people over here, boxing fans and stuff, talk about your friendship with Sonny Liston uh, because Sonny's no longer with us. But you were two mean dudes together. Or were you two misunderstood dudes at, at the time? <laughs> I don't know. When, if Sonny Liston would make one step to the left, I'd try to follow print per print. I wanted to be just like him. It was my first guy role model in boxing there, yes. And I liked what he did, and I tried to imitate him. And you but I don't know. So if Sonny Listen was me uh, or not, I was just like him. But it wasn't in depth, you know, just copycats. Was he a mean dude? I didn't find him mean at all. He was a friendly fellow. He didn't like to talk. But for some reason, he picked moments and to give me a little bits about his life. You know, my mother said, my grandmother taught me, always keep a pair of shine shoes and a nice haircut. In other words, she was telling me, uh, don't be a hippie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so he, he, for some reason, he tried to, you know, impart wisdom to me. He wanted to teach me things. And you sparred him a fair bit, didn't you? We had some outstanding sparring sessions. Dick Sattler, you got to call him a genius because he could develop a fighter like myself and at the same time manage a good fighter in Sonny Liston. So we spar together. It was mostly, you do this, George. Sonny, you do that. It was never like freewheeling out there. How competitive was the sparring? Hard? Well, he uh, and and... After that, I, I'd work with Sonny Liston, and I noticed he would never hurt me, never tried to hurt me at all. He looked at me as a young kid coming on, and uh, even when I didn't know how to control myself, I was going off on him. He kind of excused me. Uh, so it wasn't a competitive thing. It was like the teacher and the student. Sure, I'm with you. Um, we hear about... Um, the gangs and ghettos in Philly and New York and stuff over here in the UK, but what was Fifth Ward like? I don't know, uh, uh, typical. Uh, I grew up, there's always two streets to every neighborhood. You can get on the, on the wrong side of that street, which I did, and a lot of kids were on the other side. I mean, they grew up to be great school teachers and coaches and all of that, but I was attracted to the bad side, so I got into a lot of trouble because I was looking for trouble, if you know what I mean. And it was boxing, and more specifically, the job call that steered you away from that, am I right? Yeah, I joined the job call at 16, and I just wanted to become a better street fighter, to be really, really honest with you. Next thing you know, I won a golden glove here, a golden glove there, and in less than two years, I was an Olympic gold medalist. But I never intended to be a boxer, I wanted to you know, get back on that street and have a uh, little badge of honor. Oh, really? Okay. But when you came back from, uh, when you came back from Mexico with the gold, you'd obviously wave the uh, uh, flag of the United States. You were a big deal, not just in your street or the right side or the wrong side of the street, but the whole country. Yeah. Can you imagine one day, uh, you know, I, I had an intention. By then I was working for a job course center. And I uh, went in, and I didn't know, it just took over. You win a Golden Glove, the national tournaments, and the Olympic trials, and your life was overwhelmed. I was an Olympic gold medalist from that point on. I didn't have, the world was my home. It was one appointment after another. The last appointment of all of that was the heavyweight championship of the world after winning that gold medal. Didn't have any time to think about it. It just happened. Um. 
and then something we've talked about in the past, I'm just a little bit all over the place at the minute, but something we've talked about in the past is your love of dogs. Where's it, where, where was, who was your first dog? I've always had a dog, even when I shouldn't have had a dog. <laughs> I've always had dogs. I remember I, I, I had one I could travel with later on uh, after I won an Olympic gold medal. I, I get a dog and then let my mom keep it, travel with it, let my mom keep it. I've had a dog since 1968. And of course, the ultimate was the German Shepherd uh, relationship I had with the German Shepherds. And, and that has taken me to this day. I still have them. Do you, how many do you have now? Uh, can't count them. <laughs> oh, wow, wow, wow. That many, because I have a kennel. And of course, I show dogs as well. I show dogs and I keep them for my uh, uh, companionship with, with the German Shepherds. And I breed them. And so it's a love affair, a long love affair. Well, there's more loyalty with dogs than there is in boxing. And Mickey Duff, the old promoter, used to say, if you want loyalty, buy a dog. <laughs> That's probably why I kept buying dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Too many snakes in boxing, not enough dogs. Um, when you look back on your career, I mean, how satisfied are you? You did so much and achieved so much. And I don't mean that like as a soundbite, but you, you've done extraordinary things that no one else has compared to. Yeah, I had an outstanding life with boxing. If it had not been for boxing, I know not where I'd be now. Boxing was everything for me. I got a chance to travel, learn, and give me time to read books because I'd be in hotels alone. Boxing was everything for me. I was able to learn and earn a lot of money. Spin it all up, by the way. But it was so much fun to travel and meet people, buy cars. But boxing, what can I say? It even took me to the door, to the doorstep of the Almighty. After a boxing match, I had an experience with religion and have not left it since. All because of boxing. And the first incarnation of you, George, if I may, I mean, you came along in an incredible era with a top 10, 15 or 20 with Eddie Mason, Zara Foley, Floyd, Patterson, uh, Jerry Quarry, George Shavala, Jimmy Ellis. And that's even before we get to you, Joe and Mohammed. I mean, it was a deep, deep division filled with sharks, but you were one of the biggest and baddest sharks. Yeah, it was like, what can I say? It was like a star, a sky filled with stars. Eddie Machen, not many people would know that name. Floyd Patterson, the one fight I wanted to be a part of and be to watch was the first Jerry Quarry Floyd Patterson match. Because in the job court, uh, during the day or uh, in the afternoon, we guys would watch boxing from the Olympic Auditorium. And Terry Quarry and Scrap Iron Johnson, Indian Red Lopez, they were the stars. And when Floyd Patterson and, Mo, uh, uh, and uh, Jerry Quarry met on ABC Wide World of Sports, I wanted to be there. That was the first time I felt like a real boxing fan. Was it? Okay. Um, you have 19, 1967, that is. Your memory is outstanding. And we'll come on to that a little bit later, if, if I may. You did have an early fight with Jack O'Halloran, who, who, who actually went on to star in the Superman movies. Was that ever something that you seriously considered? Is it a sideways career? I know you have done some movie work, but was that ever a, a big plan of yours to go into movies? Now, a lot of people go into the movies to become famous and wealthy, and by boxing, it already done that for me, so I didn't really care too much about the movies, but I remember with Jack O'Halloran uh, starting that Superman movie, it, it felt like I was there. <laughs> I was so proud of him. That was a proud moment. I tell, hey, we fought. Hey, I fought him. I love telling that story. That was a, it was like I was in the movie that time when, when Jack was. Well, he played a scary monster as well, and you were a scary monster at the time too. <laughs> I was just so proud of him, so proud. He was truly acting. Um, you stopped the unbreakable George Chivalo. How tough was George? Well, I haven't knocked him down yet. It was the third round. We really got into it, exchanging punches. I got him up against the ropes. And it's fortunate for me, his wife was at that fight. 
and she starts screaming, stop it. She didn't want her husband to get hurt. Stop it, stop it. He And really that helped me because I don't think I would have knocked him out. That was one tough cookie, George Chevello. Unstoppable. Well, not unstoppable, but you couldn't put him down. Yeah, no one, no one managed to do that. I haven't that. knocked him down yet. And then you were 37 and 0 when you fought Joe the first time and you stopped him early. That was a huge win. I've just been reading the book or the recent book on Joe Frazier by Mark Cram Jr. Um, and it's and it's interesting, but obviously that fight, um, he was unbeaten, and so were you, but you really put well, it was it was one of history's greatest markers. Yeah. And, and so many people were more, were unaware that. I was boxing and fighting all the time. Joe Frazier, of course, was the champ, and he was having he was having big fights every now and then. But I fought because I wasn't making much money. I fight twice a month, and so I had to fight. And Joe Frazier didn't have uh, really about not quite half of the experience I had. I had thirty-seven boxing matches. I don't even think Joe Frazier had thirty boxing matches. Maybe twenty-two or twenty-three matches. And uh, when he got into the ring with me, I had more experience, believe it or not. But I have heard the story that when you went face to face with Joe in the ring, you were glad that he was looking at you in the eyes because he couldn't see your knees shaking. I was scared of him. I'm not going to lie. Joe Frazier, uh, I saw him fight Buster Mathis. Big man. Joe Frazier labeled on him like a termite. Next thing you know, that big man fell to the ground. Every big man in that fight, in that arena that night, walked out thinking, mm, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. He brought that to life. He was Joe Frazier was a little guy who you feared was 10 feet. Did you have it in your mind that you could walk through him like you did? No way. No way. I boxed him. I really outboxed him the first couple of minutes of the first round. I outboxed him, which I could. I was more experienced. But then I knocked him down quickly with an uppercut, a right uppercut. And from that point on, I just went for the knockout. He was like, George will come and get you. But I was a, really a boxer puncher. It was overlooked. I knocked him down after outboxing him. Stop, block, get him out of the way. Boom, 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 boom. And I, Slipped in an uppercut when I was, wow. I said, he's going to get mad and kill me. I better go for a knockout. And, and that, then, that's what happened. I didn't walk through him. I just caught him, and he never recovered. Sure. Okay. By the time you crushed, and I say this with all due respect, but by the time you crushed Ken Norton, people thought you were invincible. Did you think you were invincible then? Well, certainly. I really fought a guy in Kingston, Joe, uh, Joe Roman. And... Yeah. Uh, Japan, and uh, they, they, everyone told me, make sure you land your punch here, land your punch there, try not to hit a guy there because you can't knock him out. And when I was fighting him, I hit him in those places where you're not supposed to knock a guy out. And when I did, I dropped him over and over, and I thought, I'm the hardest puncher ever. Nobody can hit guys where I hit them and knock them out. I thought that I was invincible. <laughs> Like the, the, what they call the icing on the cake. I thought, boy, I'm invincible. That's a good word to use. And so Ken Norton, even though he had this fabulous Herculean physique, that wasn't anything that got in your mind at all. You, you just managed to blitz through Ken Norton as well. It's not like you want to look across the ring and see guys built like Ken Norton your whole career. But that guy was nothing but one big muscle. And I thought, man, that's not what I came into boxing to box. And, uh, and of course, I got him too. I, once again, I outboxed him. I made him miss me for a few shots, hit him in the body, miss me again, hit him in the body. And then once I dropped him, I went for the finish again. It wasn't like I was coming after him uh, like a termite in, in Joe Frazier style. I just would catch guys off once. Uh, shake them up and go for the finish. And I'd become a great finisher. Yeah, I mean, you, you say there, obviously, that you boxed with Joe and Ken for as long as they could last with you. Do you think you got the credit that you were, you were due no. as a boxer? 
no one ever noticed that I was actually a boxer puncher, that kind of fight. I outboxed those guys. But when I hit them with a hard shot, I finished them. So everybody starts thinking George is just a big slugger. That slugging never came about until I hurt those guys. I went for the finish. Um, we've spoken about Zaire many times in the past, and it's always it's fantastic to be able to speak to you about it. For me, I'm not sure how good it is for you. How, how, how is it to be associated with prop, quite possibly the biggest sporting event of all time? And nothing seems to outlast that rumble in the jungle. I tell you, I always call it the mugging in the jungle because I got mugged over there. Uh, lost my title belt. But it's an important piece of uh, uh, information that fight meant a lot. And as the years have gone by, it stood the test and it still comes out as one great boxing match. I didn't win the match, but I'm so happy I was in it. I was part of it. And what was your relationship like with Muhammad beforehand? Obviously, I know you guys grew all gracefully together um, and went to loads of functions and did lots of stuff together subsequently. But what was it like going over to Zayed? Did, did you know him before? Were you friendly? Yeah, I had met Muhammad early on. And each time we met, we were friends. I liked him. He was always kind to me because I was the guy coming up. It goes like this. I was fighting uh, Roberto Devola in Madison Square Garden. Muhammad Ali was in, he was in exile, so to speak. He was introduced in the audience. He came up, went to hit the opposite corner, and then to my corner, he whispered, keep punching, you're going to be champ. That's the relationship I had with him. And I see him a few times more. He was always nice to me. We were friendly, very friendly, until the bell rang for the fight. Then the friendship went out of the window. Um, one of the questions I've always wanted to ask you about, Zaire, was how bad was the postponement and how much did that affect you? How bad was? The postponement of the fight, the fact that there was the cut. Oh, no, no, no. Back. Oh, yeah, that, that, that threw me off a lot because I think if that fight had gone on, on schedule, nothing happening, I would have, you're talking about literally walking through him, that would have happened because I was at the peak of that George Foreman style, boxing, punching, I knew what I had to do. But once the postponement happened, I, I didn't spar anymore. I couldn't even box or uh, anything. I just ran trying to heal a scar over my eye. And it was a good cut too. And so when I got into the ring, I just went for the finish, didn't take my time and try to box him. I just tried to run over him. And no one had ever truly done that to uh, Muhammad Ali in the first place. And uh, the postponement had a lot to do with my bad showing. Because you wanted to leave, didn't you? And then go back for the fight. Yeah, uh, I didn't want to, you know, I, I really would have preferred to leave Africa and go and get my eye healed properly where I could have let it heal. You know, one month does not heal. Uh, and then, but the cut didn't open up again. But I didn't know what to do. You're stuck, you're in shape, and you can't stay in shape. You either... Uh, what you got and uh, it just it was a bad thing for me that and then, uh, took on another life my trying to run over a genuine champion like that that was not going to happen um, what was it like in the stadium that night just describe the atmosphere the heat no none of that affected me the atmosphere was fine I had won the title in Kingston, Jamaica, defended it in uh, Tokyo, Japan, defended it again in uh, Venezuela. I was accustomed to fans liking me or disliking me. In Venezuela, they truly liked Ken Norton, and they pulled for him. And, but it had no effect on me. The crowd and the time, none of that stuff. The weather, nothing had anything to do with anything. I spoke to your old colleague, Larry Merchant, a few days ago, and he said he flew out with Ali on the flight, on the flight to Zaire. And Ali said that if, if you didn't stop him in seven rounds, your parachute wouldn't open. <laughs> Everybody's got something they said, but look, I lost the fight. Boom. Shocked. Surprised. 
but I got another chance 20 years later. That's all that counts. Sure. Um, with Mohammed, how good was he at that point, 1974? How good was, did you, were you amazed at how good he was or, cause you, you were, you gave him some serious stick on the ropes. He was a smart fighter. I can give it to that. He was a smart fighter. And you don't, you don't want to say how good someone is. If you can think, I think probably the greatest athletes in the world are those who can drive around those racetracks. I mean, those guys go at speed sometimes, 200 miles an hour, and they know to shift down, shift up, look, you know, look, take a look at beside you and all of that. Muhammad Ali was able to do all of that in the boxing ring. Think. And that's not easy. I learned to think years later, but he was a good thinker. And that's what made him good. He could think. Just one, one more question on that, on, on Zaire, if I may, George. Um, how many times have you re relived that fight and wish you could have done something different tactically? Uh, I don't know. Counting last night. <laughs> 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 but, uh, you know, you go through fights, and uh, even the ones you win, sometimes you think and you keep thinking and going back over. And I'm happy that I, I'm able to get up some morning and go over old boxing matches, think about them and what I should have done and what I could have done. I like that. It gives me something to look forward to. Come to find out, uh, and I'm watching, sometimes I even watch the old films of. Uh, uh, when we were king, I keep thinking I'm going to win this one. I know I'm going to win this time, and I never win. You have to re you have to redo the ending. Um, while we've been in lockdown, a lot of people have been going back to some classic fights. One of the classic fights that they've been going back and watching was the next fight that you had, which was the wild war with the great Ron Lyle. Um, you've never, I mean, not many people have been a part of a fight that's as spectacular as that. What was that like? That was a tough fight, boy. And if it had not been for the Muhammad Ali fight, that kind of fight never would have occurred because my being knocked down and hit so hard by Lyle, I had to get up. One of those times, like, what excuse am I going to use now? What am I going to tell people what happened this time, the reason I lost? Couldn't think of anything. I had to get up. I had to get up. How did I do it? I had to get up. And so that fight was brought forth and the competitive of it, competitive because of the, the African fight, the fight in Africa. Was it exciting being in it? I, I wish I had not been in it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my life would have been a lot better without that boxing match. Woo, it was rough. Um, talking about wishing that you weren't in it, I suppose Joe Frazier wished he hadn't, for you again, but he did coming up. And but I've read subsequently, you knew that you had his number. Was that a case of a good big guy being better than a good little guy? No, I didn't give it that much thought. As a matter of fact, I didn't want to fight Joe Frazier after, especially after the rough time I'd had with Ron Lyle. Uh, the promoters kept saying, Joe, we can get you so much for Frazier. I said, man, maybe I have heard. I didn't want that. Ron Lyle had been enough of me. I thought if he could do this to me, there's no telling what Joe Frazier might do. That's the way I felt about it, and that's the truth of the matter. Okay. Um, and then a few more fights, and then it was Jimmy Young in Puerto Rico. You f referred to that earlier. It was a loss to Jimmy, who I met in Philadelphia many years ago, who I really enjoyed his company. Um, and he talked very fondly of you. Um, Tell me about poetry. In fact, going on from that, obviously you had, um, uh, you can tell me, but what happened in the dressing room afterwards, I spoke to Bruce Trampler relatively recently and he was there in Puerto Rico with you, I believe. And Bruce... Not in the, not in the dressing room though. Okay. But he said that what happened in the dressing room startled a lot of people, probably not least yourself. Yeah, that was an experience for me. I went over to Puerto Rico to win an easy 12 round decision over Jimmy Young. And I had was sold the goods that I should make my fights go longer. I was knocking people out too quick and the networks weren't getting enough commercial in. Dunn King convinced me to take the fight and make it last longer. 
and I went out trying to do that, can you believe? Then when I went to finish Jimmy Young, he almost knocked me, they did knock me down. And, but I, at least I still felt like I won that boxing match. I was ahead on the points, but I lost the boxing match. Whew. But I'd gone 12 rounds, which was my main goal, to show the world that I could go 12 rounds. Went back to the dressing room after I heard the decision. I was like, how did that happen? And I went to cool off and my whole world changed and it hasn't stopped since. My whole world changed. I had an experience, I was dead and alive again. In a split second, alive in the dress room after being dead, and I was screaming, and I haven't stopped screaming to this day. Jesus Christ is coming alive in me. I looked on my hand, I saw blood on my forehead, I saw blood, and that scared me because I didn't believe in religion. I topped it, but I didn't believe in it. I thought it was just some sale that you give people who don't have anything else. So did you go to Puerto Rico as the big scary George and you left Puerto Rico as the George that I see now? <laughs> that scared me, man. When you meet face to face with death and you really understand that you don't have any power of it, it changes you. The first thing you do is wake up in the morning, look at yourself and say, I'm alive. And nothing can be bad when you're alive. And that's what the person I've become, happy to be alive, George. And at the time, that was you done with boxing, finished. Uh, 10 years, I didn't make a fist. I couldn't put it together. I didn't know that was religion. I didn't know anything about this Jesus Christ stuff. And I saw this blood on my hand. I tried to talk myself, where well, you got hit? I had, I tried to talk myself out of it, but the smell of death, I died in that room and was alive in a split second. You, ne you, you never can forget it. And for 10 years, I didn't even make a fist. I start talking, telling the story. Next thing you know, people, my brother Joy. Ah, real? And uh, it went on for 10 years. I didn't even think about becoming a boxer again. For 10 years, never would I come back to that sport, I thought. Did you watch it at all during that period? I didn't even have a television for 10 years. Wow. Wow. Okay. Didn't go, I never attended a movie in 10 years. All I had was I read every magazine, uh, the newspaper every day, and I kept up with everything, not just boxing, but all things. And if a boxer's name would uh, go across, I'd read about him. Uh, I didn't see the Jerry Cooney and Larry Holmes fight. I heard about it. People would ask me about it. I knew nothing about it. I never saw the A-Team television. I never saw, uh, what was a great movie that would come through in the 70s. I didn't see anything. I didn't know anything about boxing. No, I did not think about it. Wow, that's astonishing, especially that it played such a big part. But also understanding, because you've gone so far. Mohammed called me. He was, uh, we be, Muhammad Ali and I became good friends. And he would call me sometime before a boxing match. And I tell him, man, you better leave that alone. You shouldn't do it. <laughs> and he called me back later on and talked some more. And I said, well, maybe you should try something else. I was talk religion too. And but other than that, I stayed busy doing other things. I call it the back door of life. The back door. I'd come into the back door with a big life. People would invite me in and give me food. I didn't have to be champion. I didn't have to be dressed up. I, that was a big back door that was more pleasant than the front door of being champion of the world. And when you came back, it was, it was to raise money for the church? No, I didn't need money for the church. You don't need money for the church work. I had a George Foreman Youth Center. Okay. I started the thing and then a guy, I started, people started inviting me out. And as I would speak to them, they would, donate to my youth center. One time, a guy asked me to spend three days in Georgia area. And I spoke for three days and he started collecting and there I was, he said, we can give George more money for his kids. Come on now, he's there counting the money. And I felt like, man, what has happened to me? Begging for money after all the things I had. And I said right then, I'll never ask anyone for anything ever again 
I'm going to be heavyweight champion of the world. That's how I'm going to, how I'm going to get money for my youth center. And I went back to boxing. And that answers my next question. Was the dream to win the title again or just make some money? But you, you, you were there. You meant business. You were there for the title. Yeah, I have integrity. I said, I'm going to be heavyweight champ of the world. That's how I'm going to get money. And you just, and so the money is important, but it was very important that I became champion again. And I fought for the title twice. Yeah, I mean, when, when you came back, you beat the likes of Smoking Burt and Dwight Cowie and Jerry Cooney. There were some big, high-profile scalps that you took. Did you feel a different fighter? Uh, oh, no, I knew how to fight. I always knew how to fight. I had to change my style a little bit, but I knew how to fight. And when you lost to Evander, was that not mission accomplished? You, you know, people, some people hadn't taken your comeback too seriously you left the Holyfield fight with a whole heap of credit. Did you not think, ah, I've given it a good go, I've made some money, I can, I can call it a day there? Yeah, that event of Holyfield, that was like herding bees. <laughs> Just when I had him, he'd be over there and hit me five times. Just when I turned there, he's over there. <laughs> he was so fast. And, uh, but I knew then, uh, uh, because he was holding on to me in the 12th round, he kept holding on. And I said, you know what? I could have got mean like I used to be and finished that fight. So I, I kept at it. People ask often, um, how close were you to the Larry Holmes fight and the Mike Tyson fight? Were, which one were you closest to? And would you have liked both of them? Mm, I never came back to fight any person at all. It was the championship of the world I wanted. And it was more easier, Tyson, when he was champion, that style I thought would have been more easier for me. It would have been more easy, I'm sorry. That fight would have been most easy for me because of his style, Mike Tyson. But not if he's not champion of the world. I'm not in, I wouldn't have been interested in either. Um, you had a tough fight with Alex Stewart, and then you fought Tommy Morrison. Both good fighters, both handfuls in the day, back in the day. Yeah, I guess you see, hit the nail right on the head. Both handfuls. <laughs> they were good fighters, great fighters. Good, good, good. And uh, so when I lost those fights, well, I lost the fight with Morrison. It, uh, it bothered me a little bit, but I had other things to do. I was making so many commercials and television shows. I had other things to do. And then came Michael Mora, um, which was where we hear that famous line, it happened, it happened. Um, was there any point in the fight where you thought, I'm just not getting to him, I'm not getting to him? Uh, no, I always felt like I got to get this guy in the right position. And then the corner and I couldn't coordinate on win, but Angelo Dundee in the 10th round said, you got to take this guy out, George. You got to take him out. You're behind on points. And it just woke up what I was supposed to do. And he, he could have said that in the seventh round, and I would have done the same thing. <laughs> you should have done that. <laughs> you know, but you, it, a fight is like, it has to be a team thing. Yeah. What was it like working with Angelo, who'd, who'd obviously conspired against you so many years earlier? Yeah. You know, I'm just about run out of town, my, time, my friend. Oh, uh, sorry. Okay, sorry. I have, I have five questions from some listeners, from some readers. Is that okay, just to give you the five questions? Sure. Okay. Um, so, Chris Glover says, um, how has the heavyweight division evolved physically, and could the likes of Ali and Frazier have dealt with the likes of Tyson Fury and, and the Klitschko's? I mean, two fighters get into the ring, Nothing, nothing is, is considered is going to happen until the bell rings. You put Muhammad Ali in the ring, nobody knew he could beat George Foreman. No one knew until, boom, I'm on the canvas. You get George Foreman and Michael Moore. I'm the bigger guy, of course, too. No one knows what's going to happen until, boom, Michael Moore is being counted out. That's the way it is, and that's the way it's always been, and that's the way it will be. Okay. 
Um, Dave Robert Shaw, what are your thoughts on Holyfield and Tyson talking about coming back in their 50s? Boy, live and let live. Uh, I wanted to come back at 55, and I could have done it too. I really could have. They could really make good names for themselves. I think the fight shouldn't be in alone in four to six rounds, though. If they want to fight fights like that, I mean, boy, I'd love to see Tyson in action again with that style. Um, Lower Smith says, uh, Mora or the grill, what was the biggest success? Well, the grill could not have been without the success of George Foreman and Michael Moore. Okay. That match. It, had, um, it, it took the whole thing. John Evans says, uh, you love horses. If you had your time again, would you rather have won the Kentucky Derby as a jockey or the heavyweight title? Mm, I still would like to win a Kentucky Derby, but I don't think I'll ever be a jockey and not that small anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we touched upon this earlier, James Mormon. Uh, how close was the Tyson fight? Was it something that you negotiated for? No, some, for some reason, Mike Tyson would not fight me. No way. He just wouldn't do it. And I have to, sometimes I had to just push it away and say, look, he doesn't like me. <laughs> it's one of those situations. He just didn't want to fight me. Okay. Um, George, I just want one, one more from me in closing, if I may. Um, we've swapped a lot of messages over the years, and sometimes it's been when you've lost people close to you, whether it's been Mohammed, whether it's been Joe, and last year with Frida. You've seen, you've seen a lot of heartache, but you've managed to maintain your positive disposition. Um, how, how hard has it been, some of, the, some of the lows you've experienced? Boy, and I still haven't gotten over uh, either of them. Uh, neither uh, Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier, my daughter Frida. I wake up every morning and forget. I can't call them on the phone. <laughs> I still forget they were such great people in my life. Oh, I had a great part of my life that it's like they're still living. And I'm not crazy either, but I still feel like they're still living. Yeah, Lovely. Well, thank you so much for your time, George. I'm always grateful and thank you so much. Thank you. Stay safe and well. Thank you.